Hey, good evening everyone. Professor York here and I am excited to be able to do a recap on our business model canvas uh, lecture that we did this afternoon and the purpose is really just to hit um, highlights just to reinforce key concepts and pieces since this is going to be a tool that you will be working with not only through this class but if you move forward in terms of entrepreneurship will be in very very important to uh, building out models testing models seeing what works or doesn't work and the concepts if you don't become an entrepreneur and start your own business the concepts are definitely applicable in the corporate setting as I mentioned uh, about one of my students from the um, spring who ended up using these concepts with United Airlines during his internship and he impressed he won a competition with his team using these concepts and impressed a lot of people over in management so uh, i certainly hope you'll get some value here so uh, the first piece is going to be value so just a quick recap we have the bmc as you remember leah had uh, gone through and did a really nice job i think identifying um, the different the nine different pieces of the BMC, but I'd like to break on a higher level in terms of the BMC being two pieces. One part, which is the right-hand part, which is the value piece, and the left-hand part being operations efficiency. And you, you need to balance the two far, parts because you need to be able to bring in value, give value, and, re, and, and extract value um, so that you have revenues coming in to the business as you can see here on the other hand is you have to operate the business you have to manage resources and operations and activities and that's going to involve costs that are there and ideally what you're hoping to do in if you're going to be successful is is that your revenue model is such that you're executing at such a rate that um, your revenues are exceeding your costs uh, as you know uh, lack of cash flow or poor cash flow is probably one of the top reasons why businesses go out of business. And one of the other concepts that we've talked about is this relationship between the customer and the value proposition. We talked about this as we discussed the, the value proposition canvas. So this is very, very critical. And uh, I think it's probably the first step in the journey here is to really understand who the customer is, or customers are and what values that you are bringing in in um, your value whatever product that you are or service that you're providing so you have that there we'll move on to next slide let's talk customers so customers you know what I think what we have to think about is first of all some key questions for whom are we creating value it's not everybody we have to start segmenting down and we need to prioritize who's most important all right so we're talking segmentation different types uh, so with segments you have to think about you know uh, each segment that you have will have a distinct offer uh, maybe a different distribution channel digital versus physical versus direct different types of relationships that are there and what I mean by relationships uh, may be in terms of a selling buying relationship or an influencing relationship uh, different profitabilities a willingness to pay for different aspects of the offer as we see in terms of tiered type of uh, value propositions like linkedin where you may see in terms of various software online offerings where they have the basic pro and supreme plan and different types of segments that we look at is in the mass to niche okay specialized to segmented which we're segmenting here especially when you have mass markets that now what we start to do is niche and segment our markets and this is per Michael Porter out of Harvard segmentation is very key so that we understand what audience we really are so this is very very critical concept and because what I've noticed already is I've looked at um, some of the ideas coming through is it a little more generalized and we need to really get our segments really tight so we identify who our customers are that we can be able to effectively compete and then we have a diversified which means that you may have a business and I think I mentioned GE um, Berkshire Hathaway which have diversified businesses Coke Pepsi have 
unrelated segments where they have different needs and problems. And multi-sided is the classic, um, you know, newspaper or Google in terms of we have free customers who get things for free and customers who pay for having access to that freemium customer base. Uh, another example is next door. So uh, I think we re talked about different types of customers and realizing that there may be multiple customers in this process. Uh, what I expect is maybe one or two really key customers when you do your BMC. But you need to understand that there may be someone who is the ultimate decision maker here. But realistically, you may have individuals who are recommenders. You may have folks who are, are the, the clients, the ultimate clients that are going to benefit. You may have influencers and alternatively, you may have saboteurs. And influencers or saboteurs are important, especially in the, the web world, because influencers can be able to drive traffic to your website or to your value proposition. It could be even vis-a-vis -vis social media. All right, so let's talk about questions on the value proposition. So what are we delivering to customers? And which of our customer problems are we helping to solve? Okay, so we need to think about that from our VPC discussion in terms of the job to do. And what needs are we satisfying? And can we satisfy those with a bundle of product or services that we are offering? So remember we talked about, you know, job to do, needs, as uh, pains and gains. Well, on the flip side, you, on the left side of that canvas, you remember that there is products and services to be able to address the customer segment. What I do expect is when we talk about value proposition is to be an action verb and think about benefits that are there. So if we look at this in terms of value proposition, I think you're familiar with um, the VPT um, canvas so I'm not going to go through it any further in terms of pains gains and customer jobs to do and realize on the value map which is really around your value proposition what are you creating from a gain creator or a pain relief and again action oriented items and then ultimately your product services so this will be a very important tool especially as you start thinking about your first two briefs and need to tie in what I call um, your value to needs. And as we know, we've talked about the Bain Triangle, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but we need to understand those needs, you know, and, you know, it's uh, functional in terms of performance. Maybe it's customization, which is diversity, you know, getting the job done, maybe design, it may be price, it may be risk reduction, it may be convenience which are more traditional types of needs, but there may be new sets of needs a customer has not perceived and new audiences are there. And I think that's, as we do, especially the exercise as it relates to a uh, real startup that I'm going to challenge you to start thinking about because that's where you're going to find the opportunities for your business. So channels. Now, channels... I think you have key questions, but the important thing, as you see the truck there, is it's moving product to the customer. It is not about media channels. So what we have to think about is through which channels, digital, physical, direct, or indirect, how are we reaching them now? Is that working or not? Is it effective? Is it cost effective? How are they integrated? Because you could have multiple channels that... Uh, you may reach the customer, you know, but then I'll use the wine business as an example. You could sell direct out of your wine, um, basically your um, tasting room. You can be able to do online. You can sell through wholesalers as well. And you have to ask, okay, which ones work best and which are most cost efficient? And how do we integrate them with the customer routines? We need to think about customer behaviors, where they go to be able to satisfy their needs and get the job done. It may be through Walmart. It may be through a fancy wine shop, in using the wine example. Or if they're on vacation and they're in Paso Robles, it may be going and visiting a particular winery 
Um, or they may want to have a direct drop because they're a wine club member. So we need to understand what those routines of the customers are. That means we have to get out of the building and we need to talk to customers to understand. So um, routes to get to them. Uh, we talked about physical and digital. All right, physical being basically wholesalers and retailers. We talked about the wholesaler being really more to be able to handle and distribute on a wide range, but they don't necessarily interface with the customer where the retailer does. Wholesalers tend to be dealing with alcohol and pharmaceuticals and food in terms of bulk and being able to especially do things on a, a, a very efficient manner and also to comply with regulatory requirements. Digital are what we see with Amazon, App Store, or Google Store. And what we need to think about is you can do this direct or you can do it through an intermediary, which can be such as these digital or the wholesalers that are there. Or if you have a small audience, like as we use the wine example in terms of a winery that is, um, you know, producing maybe 5,000 cases, it may make more sense to go direct through the tasting room through um, their online, through their their basically their wine club, and it generally tends to be small volume niche. And the, the, the whole goal here is is that they do not want to be able to give, because you're going to give a lot to the channel um, for their services. So that gets to our benefits. Remember, channel gives some things to you especially as you're going broad and long and large and that may be delivery stocking inventory management marketing they play a marketing role promotion especially if you're focused more on an operation standpoint um, accounting especially like if you're in the uh, businesses like alcohol or pharmaceuticals where things need to be accounted for alcohol is big because of tax needing customer data and reaching that audience that is why in the wine business southern wine spirits dominate if you want to get into vegas texas or into florida you have to play with that distributor young's being um big southern california you, you need to work with them as well and, and and as a result there's a cost and that cost can be anywhere from 20 to 60 percent off your 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 top line price or your revenues are getting um, you lose control of your inventory and your promotion and it, like as I talked about Walmart Walmart doesn't give you sales credit until customers actually purchase so all of a sudden you know you have not have what we call an X factory sale until that customer is actually bought and I, I just like this is brilliant that what Walmart has been able to do because basically they haven't been able to lay out the money for the inventory they make you carry the inventory costs under a balance sheet. And then we talked about this concept of push and pull. Push into the channel in terms of wholesale and reseller, okay, which are very, very key to load. Because if you don't have product, especially at the retail unit, then you're not going to be able to pull. And, you know, pull is really creating demand. So it's all the things you see on TV, on the web in print that's there so you have to use these two pieces effectively together a lot of folks think marketing is just here but this whole push piece is so critical so you have to think about your channel relationships especially when you're a startup um, and i think i mentioned about the um, example with the uh, product for earwax that uh, a colleague of mine had uh, developed out of uh, texas and what she ended up doing was getting it stocked at CVS was, was really a major accomplishment. And then there's this customer relationships piece, which is really the marketing thing. I don't know why they call it customer relationships, but how do we create love? All right. That's why they have the heart there. So the question you have to think is what type of relationship? What do we have established? How do we integrate them with the rest of our model and how costly are they going to be? Because it's going to cost you money get out to do three things get as we talked about tying into a i d a which is air awareness interest consideration or decision or and then purchase a which is acquisition a i d a uh, if you want to know more about this go look at 
um, movie clips from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross with with uh, Alec Baldwin. Uh, but you're going to be using here, especially in the get side, is earn like PR and news and paid, which will be like billboards and TV and radio ads to drive. But the I and the C are very critical. The I is going to be we're going to use the internet and the consideration maybe in terms of sampling or the test drive of the product. But the keep is very, very critical because as we talked about, it's the cheapest customer you have and one you keep a long time. And that's where longevity program, product updates, um, check-in calls, customer satisfaction surveys. Um, you know, we talked about the, for like Zoe's Greek restaurant, we talked about having a punch card, which is very common with, with cafes, you know, for every five cent sandwiches you get a six sandwich free or something like that and then ultimately grow and that means unbundling your value proposition okay so you're buying individual units or upselling to a higher level such as we go from free to premium cross selling in terms of going across products and last but not least which is very critical both in terms of this growing from um, established customers but with also first-time customers, this viral loop in terms of word of mouth and repeat business. So let's talk about revenue model. We talked about it last week. You can move through this very, very quickly, but it is about the money. And you have to think about for what value the customer is really paying, okay, versus other alternatives, whether it be rivals, substitute, or even new entrants. And what are they currently paying for when you make that offering is how much more or how different, okay, and how they're currently paying. Are they paying per unit or are they paying on a subscription? Because you can change the game by changing the model in terms of how you currently pay and how they prefer to pay. They want to pay net 30 days. They want to pay up front. They want to pay credit card. Or um, do they want to pay, you know, I have customers who want to wire money. And then how much each revenue stream, because you may have multiple revenue streams contribute to the overall uh, revenue. So in a revenue model, we have to think about this is how we capture our value. We monetize. It takes different forms and a variety of drivers, as we talked about last week. So we can monetize in many different ways. We can sell the actual physical asset, you know auto house company usage fee this could be a hotel night that we say where we're renting that 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 hotel night or a rent a car a subscription is continuous access to service as as a monthly memberships fee on a web service uh, survey monkey uh, is one example in terms of a service but there are several others actually your premium LinkedIn is a, a continuous service fee and then there's lending, renting, and leasing, as we talked about last week, in terms of um, a car lease and room rental, which is different from a usage fee, which is like on a short-term basis. This is on lending and renting. Leasing is on a long-term. Then licensing, which is permission for the intellectual pro property to be able to be used. So you pay a fee for that in terms of uh, whether it be a record or a song or a literary work uh, or a photo and so you need to have copyright permission uh, that's there or if you have patented something or somebody's patented something you may have to pay a license to be able to utilize that patent and then a few more brokerage fees so we talk about when you're selling real estate or you're selling stock there may be um, a, some sort of payment for the broker that is brokering that deal and advertising, which we see with um, SEO and ads, whether it be newspapers or with Google and multi-sided, which ties into um, where, you know, one side is free, as we talked about with Google. Um, and then uh, you have the other side, which is paying in terms of AdWords, web placement ads, or um, you may even have where they pay for your data. Um so those are some things to be able to think about. Uh, tiered membership is going to be uh, like LinkedIn, where you have different levels of customer participation and benefits. 
uh, lower levels may be free and for the higher service levels you may pay for a subscription and you could have a corporate um, subscription last but not least we get into this thing called the revenue model we talked about the drivers which are number of customers the units per customer the frequency of purchase customer price per unit those are the four key drivers you, you always need to be able to think about when you think about trying to create a revenue model I don't want you to get granular as as Matt did, but I think this will help you a whole lot. And and you need to think about when you talk about customers, you know, uh, Tam Sam Sam, which we've talked about beforehand. I won't belabor it, but you know, in terms of um, you know transportation, then we look at trucks, and then we came to I think you know the pickup truck markets. And as you do, you're segmenting down in terms of more addressable and targeted markets. And this is very important. We also talked about bottoms up being more accurate than top down. But And we also talked about how investors do like large growth markets, uh, opportunities, you know, 50 million plus versus what we'll just say a lifestyle business. And then along these lines, we also think about CAGR, which tends to be your growth rates. And then pricing, and again, along with the other drivers, you may have some variability here. You may have the actual list price, but with pricing, as we know, we may have pricing that is product feature dependent, okay, depending on what you're getting in that value proposition. You may have um, what we call segment dependent, so you may have different pricing depending on segments of the business, okay, in hospital business or in healthcare, hospital versus a patient may have different pricing based on volume that's there, and then we get in the volume. How much volume, larger volumes tend to get greater. Also, loyalty tends to get um, a, a greater benefit as well in terms of discounts. Negotiation gets in terms of what you negotiate as two parties, as a bargaining. You see this in bazaars, but this happens a lot in real estate as well. Uh, it, so that's a classic example yield management depends on you know time of year time of purchase and inventory available that's there if you have tight inventory you might be able to charge a higher price you may be in high demand season like christmas you may be able to charge a higher price real-time market tends to be in terms of supply and demand which we talk about like housing markets and real estate markets and then auctions like ebay are uh, another good example so anyway that wraps it up i'm going to stop here let you take a breather and then we will come back in a little bit so that we can talk about part two which is operations and efficiency so hopefully you're having a few good take-home points that are there and um you know we've learned about you know creating value and being able to extract value okay take care i'll talk to you soon